Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and uh, here is a big news flash. Men who exercise live longer. Go figure, right? <laughs> I like this study though. Um, the study included 5,738 Norwegian men who were born between 1923 and 1932 and then they were examined in the early 70s and then again several years later. And over this time, the men were, ca men were categorized as sedentary, moderately active, or participants in vigorous activity. Now, moderate activity meant things like just regular exercise, sports participation, uh, heavy gardening, being do doing something for four hours a week or more, while vigorous activities included hard training, competitive sports, that sort of thing. Well, by the end of 2011, 2,154 of the men had died, and the researchers said 51% of the men in their 70s who were sedentary had died, while only 25% of those who were engaged in moderate or vigorous activity had died. The, minute, the uh, 30 minutes of moderate activity six days a week was associated with a 40% lower risk of death, and the more exercise the men did, um, the lower the risk of death from any cause, including cardiovascular disease. And so, again, we see this consistent consistent thing that shows up in studies where exercise is beneficial and it's dose dependent. The more you do, the better the benefit, the lower the mortality rates, etc, etc. Now lifetime habits mattered too. Men who were sedentary in their 40s, had um, they lived an average of five fewer years than men who were active in their 40s. So the researchers reported that if you increase your physical activity, it is as beneficial as for extending lifespan as if you quit smoking. That's a pretty powerful statement to make actually. Um, the idea that exercise is good for people isn't new. And I think part of the problem is that everybody hears about it so often, and so often they don't want to do it. It just has become background noise. It's easy advice to ignore. And another thing I want to say about this that occurred to me as I was reading this study is discussions about longer life often lead to people saying things like, I don't care about living longer. I, I had lunch with somebody not too long ago who said he doesn't want to live past the age of 75. I said, well, what are you going to do, jump off a bridge when you get to 75? I mean, I, I think that's silly. Um, but I've heard, heard it from a lot of people over the, the years. And I'll tell you this, though. People become surprisingly interested in living longer when they think they're going to die. And I have had many people, many members who I've discussed this with over the years who, uh, when faced with a serious or life-threatening illness, those are the ones that will sit there and say, I'll do anything. I mean, if you tell me to eat grass in the side yard, I will go do it, right? So I think um, maybe we should acknowledge that living is actually pretty fun. I know I'm determined to do it for as long as I can. And so we should take a look at what is the recipe for a long and healthy life so that you're not one of those people telling me years from now, I'll eat grass in the side yard if you just show me a way to live for a few years longer. So here it is, this is the recipe. Eat optimally, exercise, stay lean, don't smoke, have fun, enjoy life treasure family and other relationships, start now. The earlier the habits are cultivated and maintained, the better and longer your life is, is likely to be. And that sounds like a lot, but, but actually it's a lot less stressful than dealing with the consequences of not doing this. You know, I'm almost 60 years old. I spend a lot of time with people my age. I don't feel like I'm that age really, but anyway, um, they sure do spend a lot of time and energy being sick and getting medical treatment. And well, they don't think they're being sick. They think they're being medicated and operated on so they can be well, but they're not well or they wouldn't need all those medications and operations. So, you know, I think it's better to invest the time and energy in staying healthy. Just my thoughts about it, so. All right, I want to talk about mammography again. I'm coming at it from a little bit different angle than I have in the past. Um, I've talked about the problem with mammography. It doesn't reduce the risk of dying from breast cancer. It is really, really good at detecting ductal carcinoma in situ and other, uh, what Gilbert Welch calls um, the doc who's written a lot of books about this type of thing, uh, incidental lomas, better off not knowing about them and you die with them, not of them, that sort of thing. So what we've seen since mammography was instituted was lots and lots more diagnoses but no real meaningful change in the death rate from breast cancer. But there's another issue that we need to talk about because it, it's a finding that causes people to be very concerned and often they end up talking with us about it. It's uh, the issue of breast, de uh, breast density. Uh, screening enthusiasts warn women that breast density is linked to increased cancer risk and that dense breast tissue can hide tumors from images, which is true, but I'll come back to that in a minute. 
So women who are found to have dense breasts after they have a mammogram are usually, often, if not usually, encouraged to have more screening tests like MRI or ultrasound. And what's happening is that follow-up testing is turning into a whole other billion dollar industry as a result. And if patient advocacy groups have their way, this additional screening is going to grow instead of lessen in coming years. Now, patient advocacy groups, let me say something about this. These are people who are really well-meaning, but they don't have much understanding of the science. Their groups are almost always backed by test drug and device makers. And in the case of mammography, these advocacy groups who are true believers in mammography have pressured legislators in 22 states to require that a finding of dense breasts be reported to women as an abnormality so that follow-up diagnostics can be performed. And now federal legislation is pending in both uh, the Senate and um, the House of Representatives that would make it um, mandatory. This is just going to increase all of the ineptitude and false positives and overtreatment associated with mammography and just grow our healthcare bill even more. Well, images, let me say for the record, images of bre dense breasts do look quite different. Dense breasts have more connective tissue, which shows up as white on the mammograms because tumors show up as white, they can not be visible. Non-dense breasts have more fat, shows up as dark on the mammogram, so the contrast with the white tumor makes it easier uh, to read. But the problem is that just having dense breasts doesn't necessarily mean that you have breast cancer and not all women need follow-up. So according to a new study, only half of women who have dense breasts are at higher risk and need additional screening. And these researchers say doctors should be considering more than just test results when they decide whether or not a woman should have more testing. And that brings up another thing that is increasingly going on is all this attempt to standardize medicine. If the test says this, we do that. And if your markers are this, we do that. We're taking all of the clinical judgment out of it. And, um, and I don't think that's such a good idea either. But let me talk about the, um, the study itself. It was conducted by breast cancer experts, done in response to concern of some health professionals who are very concerned with all these patient advocacy groups that may have put the cart before the horse in getting all this mandatory extra screening paid for and all that sort of thing. These uh, experts point out that 45% of all women have dense breasts. This is a large population, but not all are at higher risk of cancer, and that um, if we label all of them as higher risk, we're gonna have more unnecessary and expensive tests. And these are experts in the field. These are the people who do this stuff. And additional consideration is the stress associated with being notified of an abnormal finding and the potential finding cancer. And Gilbert Welch writes about this in the book I'm covering this month for advanced study, um, Less Medicine, uh, More Health. He says that the effects of um, a false alarm in, in terms of mammography um, are felt for three years following the episode. Okay, and, and to the extent that our physical health is somewhat dependent upon our mental health, this stress is not good. All right, so here's how they did it. The medical records of 365,426 women between the ages of 40 and 74 who had mammograms between 2002 and 2011 were identified in order to see if certain subgroups of women with dense breasts were at higher risk of developing interval tumors, defined as a tumor found less than a year after the last mammogram. And by the way, those tumors are usually found by women when they become palpable and then they go visit their doctor to see what's going on. And so what they were trying to do is figure out is there some way to identify, we can't, we don't, maybe don't want to retest, we should not retest 45% of all women who have dense breasts so who should we? All right, so they were looking at, on, uh, they used an online calculator that considered several factors, none of which, by the way, had anything to do with diet and lifestyle or weight status, of course. Why would we want to factor something like that in there? But in any case, um, five-year risk of up to 1.66% is considered low to average, more than 4% considered high. Uh, two subgroups were identified as having high rates of interval cancers, which were defined as more than one case in 1,000 mammograms. One group has a five-year risk of 1.67%, uh, the other five-year risk 2.5% or higher. And, and so the authors were talking about how fabulous it would be if we applied this criteria. So they said that if 100,000 women with dense breasts all had additional tests, you'd find 89 cancers. 100,000 women, 89 cancers, all right? but. That's one cancer every 1,124 tests. But if we use this additional criteria to determine if these women should have more tests, 
they would only be given to 24,294 women and 35 interval cancers would be diagnosed or one for every 694 tests. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this sounds really still dismal to me. You know, one out of 694. So we have to subject 694 women to more testing. I, I mean, it just blows your mind. So uh, just in general, I want to return to something I talked about a couple weeks ago. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has updated its mammography recommendations, and it says, to save four lives, 10,000 women between age 40 and 49 have to be screened for 10 years. The numbers are better for women as they age, but not much. For women in their 50s, 10,000 women for 10 years saves eight lives. Women in their 60s, 10,000 women for 10 years saves 21 lives. So a finding of dense breasts just adds more screening to these already miserable numbers. And I don't know about you guys, I'm just not all geeked up about the 24,294 women having more testing to find 35 cancers. I, um, we just have to stop this insanity. And there's too much money in it to get them to give it up. I keep coming back to the same advice that I give you guys who listen to this all the time. You have to get really good at learning to just say no. One last thing I'll add before I sign off for the week, and that is I get a lot of emails from people asking how they can find a plant-based doctor or a doctor who understands all this stuff. You don't need that. You can't find that many of them, actually. What you need is either a smart doctor who reads. It would help a whole lot. Or you need the information so that you can drive the process. It somewhat doesn't matter what your doctor knows if you have the right information because then you can say, thanks so much for the recommendation, not going to do it, and walk out of the office. That's the key. All right, that's all for today. Have a great week, and I will speak with you again on Tuesday.